Th thanks very much, Dave. Uh, so I, I, I'm a building services engineer by, by background, although I'm an energy consultant. So I've spent my life criticising bad buildings rather than designing and building them. I, I'm a Yorkshireman. Uh, I'm a building services engineer. I don't like losing fights. The only fight I've lost in the last 20 years has been with a Glaswegian called Pearson. <laughs> and I, I was mugged because I went into a deck meeting with 30 heat pump enthusiasts and him, <laughs> right? And I dared to say, you can't get heat pumps that go above 50 degrees C. And he's proved me wrong. And that's why, that is precisely why, I am very heavily involved in that sort of technology related to district heating. I think there is a lot in this, and there are other approaches as well, which I'll mention as we go. Now, uh, so I uh, want to talk about opportunities for surface water. Surface water, uh, and I'm also going to talk about this code of practice just a little, uh, so I'll come back to that in a moment. But uh, Look, we've got a renewable energy source. It runs through the built environment, for goodness sake. And we need to start to tap into that. We all are sort of familiar with ground source, but not very familiar with something called surface water source, which is an attempt to actually use the sea, rivers, canals, lakes, any puddles, you name it, Dave and I'll have a go at it, putting a heat pump in. And actually, I think it's a huge opportunity, not only for heating, but for cooling as well. Uh, and that's very important because cooling is on the rise, whereas heating is falling uh, gradually as a, uh, as a demand. It's a very underused technology. It's very under misunderstood and actually not really, uh, I would call it a nascent technology in that we're still actually feeling our way a little bit as to how to do it. I'm less inv involved and interested in what's inside his box. Actually, I'm interested in how you put a box into a building and supply the heat and the cool uh, or into a district heating scheme. Now, so we set out and said, well, how can we encourage this nascent market? And so the first thing that we started to do was actually look at uh, this uh, and get this off the ground with DEC. DEC have produced a layer that shows the opportunity for uh, rivers, canals in particular, how much heat can I actually get out of them. So I'd encourage you to actually uh, go and look at that. That's part of their overall heat map. But the second thing that we've actually introduced is very much like the code of practice that we've done on heat networks, uh, this is CP2, Code of Practice 2, and it is on surface water source heat pumps. Trying to actually say to people, look, don't mess it up this time. You might have messed up the ground source area, but look, do it properly. Follow these minimum standards. And I believe that actually standards are the way to go. We've got too much guidance out there that people cherry pick and not enough hard uh, guidance as a minimum standard. Uh, and actually... Uh, I think it's starting to take off, starting to take off. Now, it's a voluntary code of practice. It sets minimum standards. It's not guidance. For 100 years, SIBSI, in, in one guise or another, have been writing guidance, and it's been misused and abused. This says, thou shalt do it like this as a minimum, minimum standard. It covers new build and existing, heating and cooling. It's for the whole disjointed supply chain that we find across the uh, construction industry. But not only is it a technical document, it is actually meant to be for procurement. The client should be saying, actually, I want a heat pump to these standards. Uh, and that is already happening on CP1 in heat networks. And we've also built a training package uh, around this. Very much like, the, the, for those who are familiar with Code of Practice 1, it's got a plan of work. The document is based around these uh, seven or eight uh, sections, starting with briefing, feasibility, design, and so on. It's all colour-coded. It's all trying to join up this disjointed uh, uh, supply chain that we find across all of the, the technologies that we've been talking about. So it starts with preparation of briefing, uh, getting the client to set the right targets and approach. Then through into feasibility, that's where I 
uh, I'm often working, but right through into construction and operation and so on and so forth. Go and read it, buy a copy, or if you're a SIBSI member, you can download it for free. Now, it's got quite a different written style. That I, I, I've exploded uh, SIBSI, and because actually now things are starting to be written in thou shalt rather than, well, you could do it like this, or you could do it like this, or you could select that temperature. And so that different approach, the document looks different, but the written style is very different, and the minimum standards coming from it are very, very different. So let's have a look at a few things that we've sort of learned on the way in Islington and other uh, areas. You've got to think about what supply temperature am I actually trying to supply. Is it 50 or is it 90 or somewhere in between? And that actually starts to determine what sort of heat pump you're talking about. Are we cooling or heating or doing both at the same time? Are you sizing your heat pump to do the whole load or just the base load with some boilers or something else topping it up? What is the water source? They have very different characteristics. Do I go open loop or closed loop? Uh, and, and one of the key things that we've now at last got something written down to actually say is, in general, if you can go with a 3 degree C delta T uh, in abstraction versus discharge, then the environment agency won't come after you with a big stick. Uh, you can widen it a little bit, you can play games with them, but actually uh, I, I think it's a good feasibility and design premise, 3 degrees C. Uh, now, the other th point is there are quite a lot of civils and structurals to do around how you abstract and how you discharge. And I'll show you some, uh, one or two pictures a little later. Now, so let's just talk about the source side. You know, if you're in the sea, it's rough. It's saline. Uh, if you're in a canal, it is very slow moving, uh, but actually picks up quite a lot of solar heat and is moving from 2 to 25 across the season. So uh, in Islington, we were actually doing some energy pro modelling, Chris and, and myself and, and Dave, and actually not only is the demand for energy moving, but the supply of energy is moving quite significantly, unlike most ground source, uh, I would suggest. And so my point is very different characteristics between even a river and a canal. So do I go open or closed? Well, little lakes and ponds, you might go uh, closed, but actually the bigger stuff, the stuff that Dave and I get involved in, in terms of megawatts, is much more uh, open loop abstraction and discharge. Now, just to show you a couple of pictures, uh, this is the sort of stuff that people are using for uh, open loop, the slinky and the slim gym. And you don't want to put that in a canal where you actually have barges going through and dredging. And so, you know, there's lots of practicalities to think about that you may not have to think about with other forms of heat pump, ground source, uh, etc. Now, in the uh, code of practice, there are actually quite a number of case studies. There are quite a number of installations from the uh, Royal National Lifeboat Institute. They've been doing smallish heat pumps uh, from the sea in this sort of way, and they've done some closed loop work as well, uh, very successfully. There's a very good installation in Plas Neuid, about a couple of hundred kilowatts. Uh, and actually, the interesting thing is that the heat requirement and the heat pump itself is actually considerably away from the water source. And the pipe work to get from this bank down there uh, up to here is actually plastic uninsulated and relatively cheap, right? Rather than having to run miles and miles of highly insulated, pre-insulated district heating pipes. So the, the cheap, there's a cheapness in there. Now, the other practicality I wanted to mention, which I'm really impressed with, a friend of mine, Kevin Byrne, uh, uh, put together, and maybe others in, the, in this room, actually put together the filtration and screening at an installation in Kingston. And one of the interesting things here is you have these screens here, which are those devices there, screening out eels and all of the, uh, the, the major crap, if you like, uh, as well. 
A secondary filter in the uh, plant room going down to 0.1 of a millimetre. But the really interesting thing is they've installed a backwash system that every hour, or based on a pressure system, back flushes the screen to actually de crap the screen, sorry about my engineering terminology, but actually that is so important because it's a practical thing that makes it work other than uh, it would have been a maintenance headache. And that is a really good step forward, I think, that system. I mentioned three degrees. In Islington, we actually looked and looked in very great detail, two stages, we won a million pounds to go ahead and all of that sort of stuff. And what we were doing there was not gaining two revenue streams for RHI and heating, but we were gaining cooling as a revenue stream by actually cooling a data centre as well as putting heat at 85, I think we were, into the Bun Hill uh, proposed phase three network. Now, the project didn't go ahead, sadly, for contractual reasons. I think Dave's said enough about that. But actually, that... I'm really sold with because that gives you lots of revenue. It becomes very, very economic where you've got heating and cooling. It really is really viable as a system. And the two, case, two of the case studies I wanted to mention, uh, you've heard quite a lot about Draman. Um, that is, in effect, a high temperature heat pump putting heat into a heat network. And that's where uh, Dave's argument won. Uh, that actually, look, we can use heat pumps on, on heat networks. Brilliant, fantastic, uh, wonderful. But the other s sort of loop, if you like, that we've come across is the approach in Kingston, Kingston Heights, which is actually a, an ambient loop. Not ambient air, but ambient at a, a river temperature. And this ambient loop, so it abstracts here. Sorry, I should use the pointer abstracts here through a plate heat exchanger and it's forming this ambient loop uh, at between 3 and 25 but we're actually finding it's between about 10 and 25 for quite a lot of the year uh, and it's supplying a lots of little 10 kilowatt heat pumps around the building and those uh, heat pumps some are heating and some are cooling and you get a heat exchange between them that's a very interesting approach, I think. Isn't that a heat network? Uh, I think it's a heat network. And let's not also forget, oh, sorry, that these heat networks, the Draman style heat networks, the Code of Practice 1 is suggesting 7050, 7040. And so that's in heat pump territory. That's the sort of number that Dave will love because that will give us very high. Uh, uh, e efficiency, COPs, rather like in Draman. Now, the two key points about Draman is that they've cascaded it to actually achieve those high temperatures. You've heard all about that. But they've achieved a seasonal COP of three. Seasonal. And that I'm really thoroughly impressed with. And that means that this is a very good technology to put onto a heat network. We are currently just starting... A, I've been looking around, uh, working very hard to try and build a Draman uh, in this country. And Islington was going to be it, sadly not. But actually, we just started some work on a feasibility study with Paul, Paul Woods, at the Olympic Park to try and look at a heating and cooling application in, uh, uh, in this sort of way. Perhaps not this big, perhaps in the three, four, five megawatt range, but actually... I think we've got to build one, then we take people to see it, and actually people will then get enthused by this nascent technology. Now, the Kingston Heights, I'm very impressed with, because this is my dapper friend, uh, Mike Spencer-Morris, and Mike Spencer-Morris is the only developer, he's not a technologist, he's a developer. He turned around to the energy strategists and he said, I ain't putting CHP in. You, you know, in your report, it's CHP. A river runs through this. I want some of that river, right? He has built Kingston Heights. Apologies, they were doing a little bit of work on it, but it's a hotel and a big, I can't remember how many domestic uh, flats on the edge of the river. There's the abstraction pumps. There are the loop pumps, the ambient loop pumps through 
uh, plate heat exchangers here and here. It's in, it's working. And with that screening and filtration that I talked about earlier. So we, I'm, I'm seeing that we've sort of got the jigsaw bits to put together here uh, and it's starting to work. But don't forget, there's quite a bit of practicality to think through. This is an installation in Brentford for a GSK. It's a cooling installation, but it's a very good example in my view of how you can tap into and discharge out to a canal. So this is the uh, abstraction point within there, uh, underneath there, and they've actually made the uh, discharge point into a sort of water feature. Uh, and I'm hoping to do something similar at the Olympic Park uh, Hall. <laughs> so that's what we've got to build. Uh, but, you know, that isn't cheap, and that needs thinking through, as does the filtration. But we're getting there to the point where this is not a nascent technology, this is a very doable, achievable uh, technology. Now, uh, so my view is look for high heat density uh, rivers and canals and the like. Look for other heat, uh, other heat networks so that you can tap into them. And if you're thinking of... Uh, this sort of technology, get hold of a copy of this, carry out a thorough feasibility study. I know somebody might be able to help you with that, right? Uh, and may the code be with you. I know it's going to end there, but, <laughs> but I'm going to have a quick rant. A quick rant to throw into the debate four points that haven't, well, some haven't come up. Number one, if we can assume that the electricity grid is going to be decarbonised, why can't we assume that the gas grid will be decarbonised? Yeah? There, are, there is work going on right now. There's a Kiwa report from, and PwC report very recently on hydrogen grids, looking at them and saying they're feasible. There's a pilot project coming to life in Leeds. If the gas grid decarbonising, there is still lots of life left in CHP. Yes, last year's average, uh, average, going back to what Paul was saying, uh, 367. So it has decarbonised a lot. Heat pumps and CHP are fairly equal uh, at the moment, but if the gas grid decarbonises, there is still life left in this technology. And I do, I am very taken by a mix of CHP and heat pumps in one installation. I think that was something that came out of the Islington project. The other couple of things, I think it's an uphill struggle to persuade people to get rid of their boilers and their radiators. This guy sat on a radiator. Uh, people love those. I'm not saying it's not going to happen, I'm just saying that will slow us down. And the second thing will slow us down is the dreaded heating installer who just wants to sell boilers, large or small. It's still a big problem very conservative market, it is going to hold us back. Uh, and the last thing I would say, I think you've seen this graph briefly, this is out on an e ETI, a very interesting ETI future homes uh, uh, report. And the blue there, last slide, blue is electricity, the red is heat. Now, if you assume a COP of four, four, reasonable, yeah? and you assume some energy efficiency in the heat provision, you still need a grid twice as big. You still need cables twice as fat, right? I don't see that happening somehow. At the moment, there's no work on that going on. Uh, and I think that's really, really important to consider. Where are we going with that grid that is famously going to be completely decarbonised? But if the gas grid decarbonises, maybe that can take up some of that slack. Uh, and I think I'm suggesting that the future will be a mixed economy of technologies, not a single magic bullet of just heat pumps. Heat pumps, yes. Not a single magic bullet, 100%. Thank you very much for your time.